Welcome to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 23. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today our guest is Michael Greenberg, a master at launching productized services and a digital operations nerd. With expertise in AI, global talent, automations, and systems, Michael's insights are invaluable for entrepreneurs. Get ready to be inspired as we explore digital entrepreneurship and operations with Michael Greenberg. Please help us continue to book top-notch guests like Michael by doing something as simple as subscribing to our show. We appreciate the constant support and look forward to continue to bringing you all amazing episodes. Thank you. Michael, how are we doing today? Thanks for coming on the show. Doing excellent, Andre. How about yourself? Can't complain. Living here in sunny Miami, Florida. Um, it's hot enough that I could probably cook if I stand outside long enough. But then again, that's what you get for living in these states. Yep. It's uh, it's pretty hot here in St. Louis. Um, I got all the windows shaded up right now. Yeah, it's probably maybe a good idea for me, too. I've got my windows open. That might be why I'm sweating in my own house. But what are you going to do? I've got three walls of windows in this office, and so I have. if I don't close them all, even with them closed, this room is five degrees hotter than anywhere else in my house. I would have to say the same. So I still shamelessly live at home with my parents, and some reason, I got the hottest room in the house. Um, like you said, you walk out to the hallway, come back in, easily five degrees hotter in here than it is two feet outside the hallway, but what are you going to do? Huh? Nothing, nothing I, mean, I really can give you a bunch of solutions if you want to dig in. There's like there aren't <laughs> that many things that cause that sort of bad heating arrangements inside of buildings, and they're all fixable with structural work. All right, maybe it's something we talk about uh, post episode. Maybe uh, we we could talk about how you could fix my room and help me not sweat when I do. Because then I got these lights coming down. I'm like, oh god, um, but. The way that we run things here, we I love to just jump right into things. Who is Michael? Tell us a little bit more about yourself, your journey, where you're at right now, what you're building. Give us a base level and we'll build off that. Yeah, sounds good. So I um, started my career about 10-ish years ago now, went to a coding boot camp, dropped out of school, joined a seed stage startup, raised a bit of money with them, helped them get to about 30 clients and an MVP. They decided to make a pivot. I decided to make a pivot as well, and uh, our pivots were not in the same direction. Um, started doing a bit of consulting, briefly worked for a venture uh, firm, not quite a studio, not quite a, like a venture capital group. It was a weird like combined family office kind of thing. Um, moved back to St. Louis, my hometown, went to finish my degree, started a business on about 10 hours a week called Call for Content. Eventually grew one business line in that to uh, mid six figures and then sold that business line a few years ago. Uh, Worked with a guy by the name of uh, Jesse Puji after that, helped him grow some of his new companies with his venture studio and then started started my first of like a batch of new companies uh, about a year ago now and then started my second one about nine ten months ago now it's been about three four months that i've codified our business into a more of a full venture like a thesis in hey this is what our company does these are the kinds of businesses we build this is how we build them this is how we grow them and just started building out that thesis so we could take a more disciplined approach to uh building productized services awesome i mean a lot to unpack right there one, um, let's just start at the core. I mean, I've met you for about five minutes now, and I, I'd be fairly confident that you have the growth sauce. Um, every single part of your career there, you said, I helped grow this, I helped grow that, I helped them grow this. Oh, no, I'm an ops guy. I'm like a B-plus marketer. So where, so where would you say so you're an ops guy, B-plus marketer, you, yeah. You've been a, a part of a lot of these great growth stories. Um, what have you contributed to those is maybe a better question then. So I do technology enabled operations. I spent 
almost seven years, specifically in content marketing and content operations. Like, and I owned my business during that time. So like, I know how to generate leads in B2B. I can build a business in B2B. I can do anything when it comes to building like a professional productized services, a B2B SaaS company. I can fill almost any role, but where I actually specialize is in like operational strategy and in the operations of those businesses. So like the mark, like the businesses I run, we're not the best at marketing ourselves compared to our competitors. We're not the best at when it comes to, we're not the highest end product. We're not the lowest end product, but we guarantee a very high level of operations and we guarantee a very high level of service as a result. And that is our competitive advantage. We tell you what we're going to give you. And then we give you that thing. So like you said, ops is where you really shine, but you can wear almost any hat within a business. Yeah, when did I mean, you I've realize been for 10 years, I've started, you know, half a dozen businesses, three of them have maybe worked Four, <laughs> if you count differently. So it, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't have a great hit rate, but uh, I'm doing good enough. Yeah. I mean, even, I mean, if you started 10 and four hit, I think any venture capital firm would say you're, you're, you're killing it. Um, well, I know that... an adventure scale, any venture capital firm would look at my wins and be like, Oh, this guy hasn't done shit. Oh, I'm saying more from the perspective that like when you throw money into 20 companies, one wins, it's great. Like four out of 10 is not a bad, um, it's, it's not a bad really track record in business. I, I want to be hitting like 70%. I mean, that would be amazing. Shit. <laughs> I'm just going to start lobbing you business ideas through the DMs and maybe you're interested in one and we go get a win. Cause uh, that's what I, I mean to all the time. It gets annoying. <laughs> that cause like even I have your bio, like right here, creators partner with me and launch profitable businesses. Like right. First thing you read under your name. W what does that mean? Let's, let's get some more detail behind that. Cause so now I you've got me, out. you've got my interest peaked. Yeah. I find distribution. Right. I do operations. I find distribution. So I find somebody who's got 50, 100, 250,000 in their audience and they haven't monetized it as well as they could. And then we say, OK, this is your audience. This is who makes them up. Let's build a productized service. And then we build and we launch the productized service to match their audience. And. How do you go about like, do people approach you and that's typically how it works? Do you approach creators and, and well, offer your services both? I'd say the better partnerships come from like people I know. Okay. Um, but I'm not saying I've gotten none from like cold outreach and we don't always like my business doesn't require me to find that partner, but that's most of the reason why I'm on Twitter is to find Got those it. partners. Because one of those is worth like a million to me over the next three years. A hundred percent. That's the beautiful, beautiful thing about Twitter is there's opportunities everywhere and you never know what's going to be that next one. I mean, you've really got, you really got me interested here in this business model. And do you mind if I like throw out a hypothetical to get like your yeah, feedback it, so I can better I'll understand? Like, I'll be honest. It's like a shitty business model. It's... <laughs> It works, but it's not, it's not like a super uh, exciting business, I'd say. Yeah. For Here's an example. I've got a cousin who has 450,000 followers on TikTok, but has never launched his own product. He's got, he's a good looking uh, guy. What? On TikTok? On TikTok. Yeah. Okay. That's, does he have like a real platform off TikTok? Uh, he's got like 30,000 on Instagram. Um, he's never done anything. Nope. So he's, he's literally never, he's taken no steps into productizing anything that he's done with his okay. platform. And, right, right. Okay. So this guy has not monetized his audience. Zero monetization has, he's a good looking guy, put he played college football, made some cool reels and made some cool TikToks, and blew up and he posts at any given time and he'll get 10,000 views and he'll have 50 girls screaming in the comments, but he's never monetized anything. He's never what, put a product what out. Is like audience? what does he, his put audience? Um, I mean, now at this point, he's got an audience, I would say primarily 
17 to 25 year old girls um and he's doing a lot of like traveling content he's doing a lot of lifestyle okay. content he's um, to me. okay that's fair so what he's are you then, then the, he's worthless to most people though so then I guess a good, I guess a good like follow up to that is what what are you looking for in a creator? They like what makes B2B them businesses? B two B, got it, I got it, got it. B two C, never have, never will. Got it. So you're saying a creator um, that could play in a B two B space is where it makes sense. Yeah, well, or like a business like, that has like a good following on socials. Well, if you said he had like a million followers on TikTok, and he was getting a consistent like. 50,000 or 100,000 impressions for video and instead of travel he was in the pet niche then I would launch a business with him got it that's a value so, that's an audience you can monetize but the audience you described is not monetizable okay at least got not it. at a level that makes it interesting for somebody like me perfect and yeah it's just my brain's always turning. So like now I'm just thinking of like how you do it, like what you're looking for in from that. So I think that's a great, that's just a good example for anybody listening. Like, because I agree, like him and I've had so many conversations where I just, when he was building the audience, I don't think it was for any type of monetization. It was just for fun. But now looking back, we'll talk and he'll be like, I wish I would have maybe realized what was happening. And got into a niche or pivoted in a direction where it was more monetizable, more valuable to other people. Like he gets great brand deals, um, but that's just about it. And it's not really like scalable, I would say. Um, so maybe I think at this point, like we're getting deep into this, what's a follow-up? Like what's an example of a creator or a company that's come across your plate that you've come in and created or productized their business? Yeah. So let's call it, let's call it mid low tens of thousands so like 20 to thirty thousand audience size uh talks about business operations and acquisitions on twitter has an email list of five thousand follow uh, five thousand audience so five thousand on the email twenty five thousand on twitter that guy can launch a six-figure business in b2b in under 90 days we can hit like mid six figures we can hit like two three hundred thousand a year and I mean, because anybody listening, like I'm, I'm sure we've got plenty of listeners. Most of my like content is guests from Twitter that most of my following is Twitter based. There's, I'm sure there's some people sitting here with like, oh, shit, I got 30,000 followers. I've got a decent newsletter I'm building. I'd love six figures. How do they go about approaching you? What does that process look PM. like? Be like, okay. yo, let's talk. <laughs> and uh, so... Yeah, so I guess, numbers. yeah, going back to that example you were just saying, they've post business content, they've got that distribution. What product are you going to look to launch with them? Is it customizable? Yeah, it Is it rinse audience. and repeat? Okay. Right. I want to find a product that's going to maximize my value from that particular audience. Got it. And so really, like that, they, okay, their business operations, their acquisitions, so we can build some sort of operations business or solving a core operations function probably is a product. It's like an outsource service, or we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch like an outreach or a lead gen service, or even just like a, a, Hey, we have a team of pro business advisors and for a hundred dollars, you can submit any business you're thinking about buying and we'll turn it around and give you like an audit and a SWOT analysis and some other things in 72 hours. Okay. And <clears throat> I guess since we're talking about these different um, businesses, like I read two tweets from you. One said you wasted a full year looking to acquire a business, had two on the plate, were about to buy them and then didn't pull through. What was that experience like? Kind of boring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I guess the, let me frame that as a better question why were there no businesses that were attractive to you? What were you looking for that you couldn't find within these businesses that were coming across their table? It's a combination of valuation and de-risking that just isn't possible in acquiring a business, especially at the size range I was shopping at. Got and it. So it's at that, at most of that range, it was normally cheaper to start the same business and I could get it going in less time for less money. Got it. 
Another interesting one, which I think is will, will lead to maybe a more fun conversation, is OnlyFans agency. Why did you pass on it? <laughs> I didn't want to own a vice business. Very fair answer. Yeah. Looking back financially, would that have been vice aside a good financial play? Yeah, obviously, it would have been a good financial play. That, and then you got to know your investment strategy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good example. Like I think a lot of people kind of get caught up in like the money hungry, like, which definitely doesn't seem like you, but a lot of people are just money hungry and constantly will dip their feet in anything, do anything. But it's, it's nice to know that we don't have money yet. It's nice to know that you had, uh, like that you wanted to stick to your guns too. And like not sacrifice something winning at that point. It wasn't like I was, yeah, it wasn't my first at bat. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good point. Like, it wasn't your first at bat. It's not something you needed to go do, um, and it just didn't align with what you were doing. Right. If I had no business at that time, I probably would have bought that business, and I would have been like, okay, now we're going to do Vice, and then we're just going to hammer Vice, and I would only own porn businesses. <laughs> that would be, that would be a different Michael I, than the one I'm speaking to now. Yeah, I mean, that Michael would probably be living in South America. <laughs> yeah, I would uh it would be it would be Miami, South America or um yeah, I think those are two those are no, two no. options. So No, no Miami. Yeah, that's uh not my not my style. Not your cup of tea down here. No. Um people. Yeah. Well, born and raised here, the first thing I say is the people here suck. Uh yeah. so not I'm I'm one of those people, but I think I'm the, I think I'm the I think I'm the good part. Um, it is tough to deal with the individuals that you see here in Miami on a daily basis, and makes you a little bit of a homebody. Like it's funny when all my friends come into town. It's like, dude, where are we partying? What do you do? Like, what do you? I'm like, I don't really do shit. Like, <laughs> I stay home. I enjoy the pool. I enjoy the beach, and I work. That's about it. But it's that that's Miami for you. It's a tourist yeah. trap. Let's talk a little bit more about your automations. Um, I know that's like a big part of everything. One of the ones that caught my attention was that you made an automation to replace VAs, virtual assistants. VAs are like a lot of them. Okay, let's 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 dive deep. Like maybe talk about the VA one, and then let's talk about maybe one or two I of mean, your favorite I, automations. No, I built dozens of automations that replaced VAs. Oh, got you. So not one in specific. Like there's not one solution. Um, no, what you're just going to have a general solution that solves for a general case. No, that's not how like things work. No. Yeah, I guess it's more complex. You have your VA do something. That thing is automatable. So I'd be coming to you with like, hey, my VA does X, Y, Z. Can you automate those three tasks for me? Could be completely different for every use case. Yeah. Got it. And I mean, how like... Like, for example, I I would want a VA as the podcast continues to scale to do research for me, to bring me notes for event for guests and things. That's in a simple automation, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I would think so. Like, if and I'm then, running a podcast, I'm going to use automations to put together my briefs. And then, like, cost-wise, like, VAs are not crazy expensive. What does it cost for me to go to you and just automize it or automate it? Automize like what's the kind of price difference on that i'm sure you've got to be saving on the automation side well you save in the long run right like the, yeah the car co- that you're asking two questions really one is how much does it cost to hire the people who have the skills to do this thing the second one is how much does it cost to operate this thing got it um so what do people typically come to you with, I guess, is, is is something that's interesting to me. Like, what is like a pretty common use case that you'll see someone come in and say, hey, can you automate this for me? Like, hey, we have this report we run every week. We have a VA. They spend 20 hours a week putting together these reports. Can you automate this? Got it. <clears throat> and, and then they'll pay us and we'll do that 10 times for them in a month. Got it. So it's really just like, 
it's really just you partnering with these businesses and kind of offering your services as, I mean, maybe this is not the right way to say, it, but somewhat customizable to like, what do you, what are, what are your automation goals? What are things that you could go in and automate? Do you like, uh, will you come and audit a business like that and say, Hey, you can automate these 10 things and here's how to do it. Yeah. And, and is that the core? What happens after the first thing, right? We get in, we yep. solve something and then we're like, okay, what are the next 30 things we can solve? Mm -hmm. And, and has that typically been, been like the, the traditional path for you is like, Hey, let me get in. I'll let me, let me handle one use case. Let me tackle it. And you'll see the value after, and then we'll go through and start to pick apart what we can and can't fix for you. Yeah. Well, we do a month to month, like subscription retainer. So okay. they're buying weekly sprints from us with that and they can pause and come back or like pause halfway through and save the sprints for later or whatever. But ultimately they're just buying those sprints from us. And so when we run out of things, we can say, Hey, do you want to keep saving more money or do you want to stop saving more money? <laughs> That's a uh, be hard pressed to find a company that would be saying, uh, I think I want to spend more. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, I mean, this is, this is far more interesting than I would have expected the conversation to be. If I had to be honest, not to say that I didn't think you were going to be really interesting, but just the thought process behind all this, the way that you approach these businesses, like I, I actually really like the business model um, because I think it's it's future proof. It's what businesses are going to want to do. And I think you're you're playing the trend too of this entrepreneurial solopreneurship, everything that Twitter's got going on right now, where people want to go and operate these million dollar businesses with two people. And you, you're kind of making that a no, I'm saying you're making that a possibility. Like you could go work with one of those people, automate a lot of tasks and help them be a solo business, which I think is what's going to continue to happen now over the next 10 years is we're going to yeah. get a lot of these smaller shops that are going to lean on someone like yourself and say, hey, automate all of these tasks so we can operate as a bigger business with less headcount. That might happen. I think it's less likely those kinds of guys will hire people like us. Our average customer has like four or five million a year in revenue and okay. a team of like 20. Got it. There's a certain level of repeatable work that you need inside of a business to make consistent automation a high value proposition. And that level of work generally requires bodies. Got it. Can you unpack that actually a little bit more for me? Like the repeatable, the repeatable actions, like just give a little more context for someone listening who's well, like interested. most solopreneurs sell info products or digital products mm -hmm. because they have very low cost to service. But if you're like an agency or you're a mid-sized SaaS company, and then you have tons of reports and marketing campaigns and all these other pieces that all need to funnel together and integrate with each other. And as a solopreneur doesn't have all those moving pieces in their business. Um, and so the more moving pieces you have, the more complex the business, the more opportunity there is for the kind of leverage we provide people. Got it. <clears throat> and like, I guess I would say what, what, what's next for this business is, is, is there more to add to it? Are you, do you want to grow it? Business. The, the automations business, like the, where you come yeah. in and help. Um, what's next is it'll grow. We'll triple or quadruple the size of the team. And how big is the team now? If you have, I'm not sure we've you mentioned got, that. Uh, we've got four, three or four. Okay. I don't know if somebody started yet. Got it. Um, and then, and then we've got another bunch of contractors. Okay, cool. And something that's interesting for me, and I, I hope it's interesting for people listening is as a as a ceo what's it like hiring individuals for your team what are you looking for in your in your team members like what stands out for what you're doing so i only hire lead operators for the companies um generally right i only hire i'll hire at most like the first four people at a company and by then somebody else will be there to handle the hiring from there okay um, but I really recruit those people generally. I'm not, I don't generally do like open applications for that sort of role. 
Got it. And then like your company, because when you're saying that, are you saying that you're helping the companies that you're partnered with hire people to fill these roles or is that for the automation business we're talking about? Both. Both. Because you call it an automation business, but it's not. Yeah, maybe I'm, cor- please correct me if I'm saying it wrong. I don't want to be misrepresenta- yeah. misrepresenting automation what it is. is like a quarter of what we do. Okay. It's a high ROI thing we do, but we are digital operations architecture. Digital. Startups. So that All means right. we do AI, we do automation, we do no code and low code. We are your advisor for building out an offshore team. We connect you with any part you you need to hire or staff in any country. And we are the people who help you design the systems and processes in your business to manage and grow that remote team. Okay. So, all right. I, I'm, I'm following you here. Apologies for, for getting so caught up in the automations portion no, of like it. there's like a million automation guys because yeah. they all learn Zapier and like yep. they're just trying to charge while they can. Yeah. So I, I like that. I like that we did touch on that, the differentiation, differentiating from just that use case. It just really piqued my interest, but you're basically coming in and standing up a, a team for a company as almost like a consultant is maybe a, a good way to, yeah, to consider well, that like a managed service provider, essentially okay. for everything related to this niche. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm getting it. I'm a little slow today, but I'm, I'm following you here. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it, this is fun for me because I mean, anybody listening, if you're watching, like, this is a really engaging conversation. I'm literally asking quite like, I'm not even looking at my notes anymore. I'm just going off of my curiosity and what I'm initial thoughts after you say some of these things, because this is not, this is the first time I've, I've talked with somebody who's doing this level of technical work. I'm typically had people who are the ones just building the solopreneurship, the ones doing, but I I work in technology. So this is very interesting to me um, just from a, like a, a base level of like a business is growing, you can come in and help them begin to build out their technology practice and grow from that area with all of these different um, kind of solutions. And then the automations, which we've been touching on is, is just a piece of that bigger picture. Right. But it's also the easiest for people to like buy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you mean, it's not hard to sell. Like if you're telling me, I can stop having to pay somebody, get that service done and realize after the cost of implementation and everything is paid, it's essentially free work almost for what I would be paying somebody a salary to continue to do. Seems like a no brainer if that's in the budget. Yeah, I think so. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, and And how many clients are you working with now from this perspective? Like, where are, you, where, are you, where are you all at from from in that area? We've uh, we've tripled our client base in the past three months. Wow! And what and what we'll can you attribute to that, that by the end of this year? What can you attribute to like what why why are you tripling? Um, are more people understanding? Are you getting in front of more people? I have a Go reputation. Ahead. I'm the guy the automation guys call because they don't know what they're doing. Okay. Right. We're uh, we are very often for companies that are on Twitter actively, we are the second company they hire to do this job. Okay. So first first individuals failed, you come in and clean up the fire. I mean that's that's, that's not a bad that's a great reputation to have. I mean, you're I, able to get shit we're done <laughs> click up partner we're like we're a vetted consultant on click up so we're one of their low level channel partners okay and that adds to maybe one or two clients a month for us nice and, and how'd you go about becoming a click up partner i've seen the app a bunch of times i've never played around with it or used it but it, it's something i'm familiar I'm with a long time click up user i know the team i've been a subscriber of the company since they were well under a hundred people. Um, wow. I sold my last company because of the operation we built on ClickUp. Um, 
I, I could and go on, but I've just been working with them for a long time. Got it. And, and what is ClickUp for anybody listening? Like that, project that's curious. Software, project management, management. Productivity software. Yeah. Got it. It's like um, the more grown up version of Notion. Okay. Fair, fair. I see on your bio, it says previously Gateway X. What, what was that? Yeah, that was Jesse Pooji's uh, venture studio here in okay. St. Louis. Huh. Worked there <clears throat> when I was working with Jesse in the middle. Got it. I mean, That's the only job I've had, so, you know. I yeah, you got to throw it, it gotta throw it in there. Pay your tributes. Yeah. Um, exactly. I mean, shit. You've got me super interested. Like, I'm going to go back and do my homework on a lot so of this you, stuff. How do you make money? How do I make money? Um, so I, I work in technology sales. Um, I'll, I'll share the company with you after the episode. Are you an SDR? Uh, or the... No, no, I'm a, I'm a full-on account manager um, in in tech sales. Okay. I, like yeah. Fast? Yeah. I, so I work for one of the really big ones, but I work at one of their acquisitions, which is in their SaaS department. Um, so you and, do B2B SaaS sales. Yep. Yep, exactly. So that's why a, a lot of this stuff resonates like with me on the structure, like the value add, how to position it, like where these businesses can get um, these services and all of this good stuff. So definitely something. Business? So I, I started two businesses in college. Um, I was very successful and then COVID uh, derailed me. So I started oh, right. Good. Yeah, it was so. I sold sneakers right when I got into college as like something fun to do yeah, and just to put some extra money in my pocket, turn that into three years of six figures in sales, selling anywhere from 150 to 200 shoes a month. And it was, um, so when COVID hit, the supply chain got really tight. Nike canned like 90% of their releases. Yeah. Adidas parted ways with Yeezy and the, so the value. The volume to keep that business alive yeah just the value of sneakers like there was i i could go into drops and cop 10 pairs of a shoe and flip each pair for 300 dollars profit the next day there's just not shoes coming out like that anymore like jordan ones are worth nothing like those shoes yeah. have no value anymore so it just wasn't financially like it didn't financially make sense for me to keep putting time and effort into it um but was what got me into business which i mean so, i had what, to what, I, so then you started another business right parlayed that into discord built a community on discord got that discord up to like 6800 members that company was doing six figures in sales a month it was all around uh, sneaker bot rentals and how to use the software so that business yeah. I, I owned a huge portfolio of software that i would rent and make 100 percent margins on I also hired 40 people who owned software as well. And I would take commissions off of their rentals that I couldn't fulfill. Um, and then I also ran a like coaching business where I would take on five mentors a month and teach you how to use the software. And I mean, it was amazing. I was, I was like 22 making more money than I needed to make. We get fast forward to COVID. Uh, my portfolio of software went from being valued at a hundred grand to 30 grand in two weeks. Um, the average price of our rentals went down like 88% or something along those lines. So all the fees that I was getting got slashed completely. Um, the overhead, I had nine employees in that business. The overhead became like a little out of control. It was a really big learning lesson for me from a business perspective, to be a hundred percent honest from you, because I mean, I'm, I'm 22, 23 thinking, I'm not going to work for anybody. Like I'm out here crushing it and reality hit pretty quickly. Um, and looking back, there was lots of red flags that I, I should have paid more attention to. I was investing everything back into the business without even me knowing that there was a clear path forward with COVID and with these potential issues and everything that I thought was a possibility, like in a negative way happened, but yeah. that I, so I, I kind of took time off. My buddy started a cigar company from the ground up at 22. And I've really just kind of enjoyed being a helpful like hand uh, advisor, somebody to talk through. And then this was kind of my next jump in. My biggest regret from those businesses was I had so much attention around me when I was running those companies, but it was all through an alias. It was all through a Discord alias. I capitalized nothing on building a personal brand whatsoever. Nobody even knew it was me. 
So I had thousands of people coming into my groups every month. I had, I was working with hundreds of owners of other groups and communities and companies, and nobody knew it was actually me. So when everything hit the fan, I actually got nothing from it other than knowledge. Like I could have taken that audience and parlayed it into what was next for me. So I came to the realization, I'm not going to make that mistake again. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy networking. This is what I, the mentorship part of all of that was my favorite part. It wasn't the, it was, it was the most profitable technically ROI wise, but it wasn't like the one that was turning the most money for me, but I always loved just connecting with people. So when I kind of sat back and I said, what's next for me? I, I love my nine to five. I make a lot of money, um, but I, I, it's not enough. Like I need to be doing something else. Yeah. This was, Hey, I can build a personal brand, create content, put myself, force myself to get out there and then accomplish a lot of the things that I like selfishly just enjoy about the business community and world. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, so. if you want to start a productized service sometime, give me a call. You just got to sell. Yeah. No, I mean, that. it's funny because now I've met a lot of, like, I never took Twitter serious. I didn't know Twitter. And I've met a lot of agency owners, people with high ticket products. And I'll meet with them and they'll be like, dude, are you interested in like selling stuff? Like, do you want to take They're some calls? Selling. No. Well, yeah. that's the thing. Like all these businesses, look, if you say, hey, I can sell. I can guarantee you a six figure business in under 18 months. I can guarantee you six figures in free cash flow in two to three years. And those are the guarantee numbers. So they're the long timelines, right? The short timelines are we do that in like half or a quarter or less of the time. And that's and like, like, realistically, that's almost all internet businesses. If you know how to like acquire customers. And so, I mean, cause I agree, like I am interested in something like I will, I do plan to monetize this podcast. Like that is my goal in the future, but you, you, you saying those things, like what, what are the requirements? What are the capital requirements? Like if I'm like right now, let, let's go. So if I wanted to just go start a business right now with you, I mean, sh I could sell to anybody. Like if I wanted to partner with you right now, what do I need to have built, created or nothing, nothing. I will just, I will give you a list of offers and I will say, Hey, Andre, you sell these offers. You sell me a hundred thousand dollars through these offers. And we're going to get you your own offer. And you're going to own half of that offer. In addition to the commission that you already got on this other stuff. All right. You, you piqued my interest. It might be something I want to talk about like off, off air. Um, yeah. because I, I, I got tons of buddies who do that sort of thing. That's how sales guys sort of get their first business going is they get a bank of products that they sell to the audience that they like to communicate with. And then they did just network and sell that product bank until they've got the revenue where then they can uh, build real businesses. Awesome. Well, I know we've, um, yeah, something we could dive into and, and I'm, I'm super interested. I know we've been kind of rambling on here. We're getting yeah. to that tail end of the episode. I ask the same question at the end of every episode to the guests and it's, Michael, what are you excited about in the near future? Um, AI video editing. <laughs> I saw this tool, Wondercraft, the other day. Or no, Wonder Dynamics. Wondercraft was like kind of a shitty uh, podcast app backed by Y Combinator. Wonder Dynamics, Wonder Studio, is a very cool CGI tool that replaces like people in a video you take with CGI and it does all the animation for you. Wow. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. That is, I got to look into that. I got to, I got to look into that because that sounds amazing. Com. Wonder Dynamics. Let me write that down actually. Um, awesome. So, so working AI motion yeah. capture essentially. Got it. Wonder Dynamics. Where can people find you? I mean, I'm sure people and that are listening are super interested. G E N T O F T E C H. Anywhere Perfect. online, that's my handle. If I'm trying to be found, if I'm not, don't bother me. <laughs> well, um, right now, his says DMs are open. So if you are trying to find him now, I would do it now before it says DMs closed if he's trying to not be found. Close my DMs. <laughs> I'm just going to hire an assistant to read them for me. There you go. Um, 
Dude, thank you so much. Like, I really appreciate it. This was a super interesting episode and really exciting. Um, I can't wait to, to stay connected and continue to see you on this journey of um, building these companies and, and being part of these amazing um, things that you continue to create. So thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, always fun. Uh, seems like you're on the right path. Thank you. Yeah. And then all of Michael's information is going to be listed in the description down below. Make sure to go follow him, connect with him. And if anything you heard resonates with you, if you think anything you heard today is useful for you as a business owner or as somebody in sales, reach out, give him a shout. You never know what's going to happen. That's what these episodes are for. So thank you so much for sticking around with us. And then Michael, again, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you. Bye now.